Hey everyone, welcome to Keeping the Beat, an engaging web series hosted live by TNMEA in partnership with the CMA Foundation. Tune in weeknights, Monday through Thursday at 7 o'clock p.m. Central Time to learn from and interact with music professionals from around the globe, representing every facet of the fast world of music. Today is Monday, May 18th, 2020. My name is Keith Peluso. I'm a singer-songwriter, uh, former Tennessee State Park Ranger, uh, NBC The Voice alumni, and the lead singer of a band called Blood, Sweat, and Tears. Uh, tonight, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about my story, and um, I'm, not a, I'm not a music teacher. Um, I'm, I'm a, a park ranger turned singer-songwriter and a guy that uh, kind of went on an adventure, and I just want to share that with you, and if that helps you, I uh, reach out and let me know. I'm going to talk a little bit, and I'm calling this talk the ocean is not just one way because I, I uh, hope we can all understand that you're not just one experience. You're not just uh, one class that you take. You are your entire life put together. And so you should be able to try new things and add that into your work. I encourage you to interact with by replying to this live video stream with your questions and comments, which I'll respond to throughout the hour with the assistance of my brother, Keegan Peluso, who is an actual music teacher and a fantastic musician. Uh, before we get started, one disclaimer, while this is being streamed live, it will remain on the Keeping the Beat Facebook page for future reference. So as such, your comments will also remain a part of the archive. Um, so without uh, anything else, let's get started. But I'm, I guess I can start from the beginning. My name is Keith Peluso, and I'm from Munford, Tennessee, just north of Memphis, Tennessee. And i uh, I have loved music for a very long time, but I, I put it off for a while. Um, my brother Keegan and I started playing music uh, in middle school. He, he wanted a drum set for Christmas, and uh, when he eventually got one, I picked up my dad's old guitar, and we started playing together. And uh, that, that kind of started our interest, and Keegan went on to play band when we were in high school, and um, instead of pursuing that, I went on and played, played sports. Um, but the, the cool thing about that was we, we both spent a, uh, a lot of time at home playing together. And as he made more friends in band, we got to, to know several other musician friends. We had a, just a revolving door of all kinds of people that played music coming over almost every night to, uh, to jam and improvise with each other. And so we kind of started in one genre and then moved around every every kid wants to play rock music at first and then we went through several different things where we would uh, uh experiment with jazz or funk or southern rock or uh, just about anything and so that really kind of expanded our horizons and expanded our interests uh i've always been really um uh inspired by very soulful powerful singers uh kind of started off in rock music with people like chris cornell and then uh as i dove more into music um, started looking into some classic rock and then into a lot of soul music and, and uh, classic soul and funk and blues and just fell in love with that. Um, one of the first singers that I really um, idolized was Martin Sexton, uh, who's a, just an, an amazing singer-songwriter. And uh, so I, instead of taking any kind of formal lessons or anything like that, I just drove around in a red Jeep Cherokee mostly and tried to sound like all the people that I, uh, that I idolized. And that is kind of how I, how I started playing music. And that's how I really have continued to, to progress ever since. Um, so Keegan and I grew up playing uh, a wide variety of, of music, uh, uh, looking, looking up to people like that. But then when we went to college, uh, that all kind of stopped. Um, Keegan majored in music. He's a, he was a music education major, right? Yeah. And, uh, and I, since we, 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 we always grew up in that, we grew up in the outdoors. Uh, we're both in, in scouts and everything like that. And I truly was fascinated with the outdoors and still am. I was the little kid that wanted to be a herpetologist when I grew up and study snakes just from tiny. And, uh, so when we got to college, I majored in biology at UT Martin and, um, uh, for the first couple of years, I still played some music, uh, started the Paul Meek, uh, or the open mic night at the Paul Meek library at UT Martin. Yeah, and I think it's still a thing. Too. Yeah, it's, I think it is still going on. Um, but had, it had several different musical projects over there. And then kind of as, as college went on, I, I, uh, I had to buckle down and, and get my classes done and get my grades up. And so I, uh, so I kind of quit playing music. 
Uh, while I was in college, I started working for Tennessee State Parks. I was doing some research on the reptiles and amphibians at Real Foot Lake, uh, which is not far from UT Martin. It's about 45 minutes away, but it's a 30,000 acre swamp um, in Northwest Tennessee. And I just fell in love with that and fell in love with working with the parks. And so instead of going to grad school and, and all that, right when I graduated, I hired on as a Tennessee State Park Ranger and um, really just kind of put the guitars in a closet unless it was a special occasion um, after that. So uh, when, I, when I went to work with Tennessee State Parks, I was, uh, uh, you go to the police academy and you go to all these different trainings and that career is a just an all encompassing it's not as much of a career as it is a lifestyle um you live on the park uh you're the you're the law enforcement you're all you're the fire all, all of the emergency operations and you also manage the personnel there you manage the natural resources there and then you uh you also take care of all the people that are there too and so there's not much room for anything else other than that with that wife that with that lifestyle uh, my wife and I started off at a at a park called Mousetail Landing, which is in Perry County, Tennessee. It's one of the lowest population density counties in Tennessee. And so uh, you're like an hour's drive from a grocery store. And so there's not really a, a, a many opportunities to to play shows there or to really get together with a lot of other musicians. And so I worked all the time and that became my entire life. Uh, I have a, a, a a strong habit forming personality. And so when I get, uh, when I lock into something, I just, I, I, I go with it. And so, um, all, all music or really any other interests other than, uh, being a park ranger and working on my career were gone. Um, so I, I did that for about five years before, um, I was at, um, David Crockett State Park. This was just a couple of years ago. Uh, my wife and I had moved to a park called David Crockett State Park in Lawrenceburg, Tennessee. And um, it's a very, very busy park. There are almost a million visitors a year there. Uh, very large staff that I was helping to manage. I was also on our uh, statewide critical incident team where you travel all over the state. Anytime there's a critical incident in the state of Tennessee, you're, um, you're called out for it. Even if you, you may have just gotten back from work at 2 a.m. and now something else has happened, so you need to go out to this other thing. Um, and so just really, really tired. And I, I didn't really realize how, how, how bad it was. And, uh, so my wife told me to, that I needed to get a hobby instead of, instead of going out and running on trails or going out bird watching, which is one of my favorite things to do. Uh, she encouraged me to go get a hobby, maybe get out the old guitars that had been sitting in a, in a closet for so long. And, so I, that's how, that's basically how my entire journey got started. So I had put music off forever and got out the, the dusty old guitars and started writing some songs in my living room at like four in the morning or uh, putting together little cover songs. And so um, I, I started putting up a few cover songs on YouTube, just acoustic things like John Prine covers. And um, it was just with a, a USB condenser mic hooked into my computer and, and iMovie, I think and started putting up cover songs um and i had less than 20 before things really kind of took off for me um so that's that's just uh um proof that I anybody you know anybody can um go and make something of yourself you just got to put in a little bit of pressure and time sometimes uh the things that you you never thought would happen would actually happen so i had less than 20 YouTube videos up and someone that watched my videos sent me an email and said, Hey, you know, I really think you should go try out for this show called the voice. And I didn't really know much about the show. So I um, didn't really take it seriously because I was working all the time mm -hmm. and um, had the opportunity to go out and try out. And I guess uh, while telling my kind of what I did for a living during the, the tryout process and all that, had an opportunity to go on the show. Um, and so that was uh, really what kicked a lot of things off. No, cool. So okay. nice you were, you're good. So nice time. So yeah. um, I should just wait on Keegan here. Oh, you're good, um, so I, ha I had this opportunity to go try out for the voice. Um, the, the only reason I had the time off for it was we also found out that we were expecting our little boy at the time. 
And so we, I had never taken a sick day or a vacation or, or anything during, during my time working with Tennessee State Parks. So I had so much comp time built up that I was able to take a very large paternity leave. And during that time, kind of realized, kind of snapped out of my own um, funk, kind of decided that um, life is, 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 is far more than just what you do for a living, that you, you should go and, and pursue everything that you want to go pursue. And so um, when I went and tried out for The Voice, I prepared by driving 90 minutes one way to go play three songs at random open mic nights in Nashville, and then made it onto the show and ended up going to the top 24. I was uh, on Blake's team initially from the blinds and then went to Adam's team for right after battles and then went to the live shows with Kelly Clarkson and had a great time. You, you learn an incredible amount of uh, information and, and so many great things on that show, not always from the, the coaches, but you learn so much uh, from your fellow contestants. And I'd be happy to, to discuss um, any questions or comments that you have about a show like that, if that's something you want to do w with part of your career um, here yeah. shortly. Cool. Yeah, I got a, I've got a question yeah, yeah, yeah. from Julie Hill at UTM. Uh, Keith, what was the catalyst to get you to break out and apply for something like The Voice? You must have had enough positive reinforcement to know you should apply. Uh, what were some crucial steps you took in applying uh, to audition for The Voice? And she also said, I think it's great that your wife pushed you and she's really proud of you. Sure. I mean, I, I, uh, um, so, so some, some major, uh, I guess some, not, not really some feedback, but just some, uh, some key things that happened to, to really get me, to really inspire me to, to go for it and go try out for something like that. Um, where it was not, or not just my wife, but, uh, I have a, I have just a, a wonderful support system of really great people, like including my brother here, um, that encourage me to do things that I don't think I can do. Um, I'm, I'm very comfortable with things that I, uh, uh, with, with, with being outside and comfortable with things that involved my career as a park ranger, but I'd kind of put, put music off and, and thought that it was um, playtime. Um, very, very hard worker. And so thought of, thought of music or thought of doing creative things as, uh, as something you do once the work is done. And that is really, really not true. And that's proving it itself to me more and more every day. Um, so I, anytime I would sing and, and, and stuff growing up, I got a great feedback from, uh, from people like Keegan and from my wife. And they, they told me that if it's something that I wanted to, to go pursue that I should go for it. Um, we have something else. Hey, keep going. Oh, I got sure. you. I got you. Sure. So my 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 core support system is mostly my uh, my my wife and my brother, and uh, my parents and a few of my good park ranger buddies uh, are are people that uh, have have my best interest in mind. And so um, either either it's something like, hey, you know, you, this is really great. You should go do this. Or it was things like m when mom said something like uh, this crying shame that you <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> crying shame that you don't go do something like that. Um, decided that if I was ever if I if if somebody like me that was uh, so far away from that, from making music as a career out in the woods, you know, and working every weekend and holiday that was going to be the only chance that I probably w really did. And so if I went ahead and checked that box, I could get back to work. <laughs> yeah, and, you. and that, uh, and so, so I went in and just, and, and went for it. Cool. Uh, I have a question, uh, cause we're going to get, we're definitely going to get into some oh, blood, sweat, and tear stuff. Blood, sweat, and tears. Uh, but while we're on the topic of the voice, um, if you, if you were on a, sh if you had to go back and redo a show like the voice, and maximize your time with the people that you're with on that show what are a few like one to three takeaways or pieces of advice that you would give somebody in, in that sort of position sure if if um if you ever find yourself on a reality tv show that's music based or talent based at all um it's very important to realize that that is not going to be your entire career. Um, and it's, it's, that's not going to immediately skyrocket you into stardom uh, more than likely. You got to make the best of your time by realizing that 
um, especially with something like the voice that you're there to make connections and to learn how other people are doing things because um, you're, you'll get in there. And for, for me, this was just a, I've, I'll, I'll tell you a story just to, to show you how strange it is. But um, other than, you know, like the kids that are on the show, every, every adult like me that showed up to, to be on that show had been a full-time musician for years, except for me. I showed up for my, my first day, um, rolled into LAX, Oh, Still playing it. Yeah. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> Thinking that maybe the whole thing was a scam. Um, met up with the person that said, okay, like you're here for this. Everything's very secretive. You can't tell anybody why you're there and all that. So they said, okay, go stand over here. We're waiting on a few other people to show up. And uh, this, this woman walked up and she's beautiful. She has long dreadlocks, just like a woman that stands out in a crowd. And I was like, wow. And she walked up and I was like, are you here for like, the thing and and she was like yeah yeah i am and i was like oh cool well hey I, my name's keith i'm a park ranger what do you do for a living she and she looked at me and she was trying not to be condescending at all <laughs> she like just true like truth and and like compassion in her eyes she said i'm a singer and i was like oh i am not i am not a singer and that uh, turned out to be sandy red who is i think in the top eight of our season just an unbelievably talented woman and a, and, a, and a great overall career musician and so if i if i had some advice for somebody to go on that show um realize that it's not your time on the show is not your entire career make the absolute best of the uh, of of that you can of all the relationships that you're going to make with the people that are there because it's not the show it's about your connections with the people you know like um I have not done any shows with Blake Shelton since I was on his team, uh, <laughs> but I have done quite a few shows with uh, other members of, of The Voice and other members of The Voice have, uh, we constantly interact and we constantly help each other out with our careers. I, I have talked to, today, I, I've talked to four of the people that were on my, uh, my season of The Voice today, and I talked to people like that every single day and we're constantly helping each other out so that's a that's huge for something like it goes on with a show like that one thing i noticed about like you coming off that show was it was it was kind of like summer camp like you came back with all these inside jokes and and like great friends and you know you've stayed in contact with most of them and Mm -hmm. you've landed a lot of stuff um what are some what are some other specific opportunities uh blood sweat and tears one of them um, mm-hmm. I kind of want to maximize our, our, our efforts talking about the voice before we move on to the blood, sweat and tears thing. Yeah. Uh, what are some other uh, specific, um, tools and resources that you've gained from being on a show like the voice? Um, what you mean, maybe some, maybe some skills or like a mindset. Yeah, exactly. Um, what, the the biggest teacher ever about uh finding your own resolve in in pursuing your art and recognizing it as an art form um is dealing with the criticism of seven million people oh yeah yeah it's uh it's huge huge and the fans of that show are so it's 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 great and then people are very 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 into that show uh but if you you, 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 if you put yourself in front of that many people, it doesn't matter what you do mm-hmm. there. It doesn't, ma- I mean, it can be good or bad. It doesn't matter what you do. There will be some people that absolutely love you and some people that really dislike you just, uh, just cause you were there. Yeah. And so, um, that's a wonderful opportunity for you to be able to take that and steal yourself, um, against criticism that would otherwise uh keep you from pursuing it's kind of like a trial by fire absolutely you dealt with the probably as bad as it could get yeah i mean um and that's and i and i i like had a i had a blast on the show but there's uh there's something to be said about being able to deal with criticism and uh um find a way to make that motivate you to pursue your craft honestly you know uh going back to when you introduced yourself to Sandy Red and you said you were a park ranger mm-hmm. and she said she was a singer, like 
you can definitely call yourself a singer now. Does that change of identity definitely help you as well? I'm still working on that, honestly. Really? Um, I, I, uh, and, and we talk about this all the time, but I'm still, I'm still very like, um, I, I'm, I've been a, a full-time musician. I've been touring with Blood, Sweat, and Tear, Tears for a year now this mm-hmm. month, and mm-hmm. and uh, I, in my mind, I still, I mean, I, it, I just, I just think of it as a job. Mm-hmm. um because you have to you have to separate your your job from your so some people are lucky enough to be able to pursue their passion as their job but mm-hmm. at some point you have to separate it and so i i, I have tried to because i'm so habit forming as far as being a workaholic or what i was as a park ranger it's um it's easier for me to have my joy of playing music and then it just some, somehow helps me pay the bills right now too that's cool that's uh, cool so your your hobby is your money maker too my hobby ends up being my money maker but that's, you still have to uh when you're when you're practicing and when you're writing and stuff like that you have to forget that it's a job yeah. otherwise it's going to be so forced that uh um it's not going to be honest gotcha uh, can you go ahead and uh while we're on topic of like stuff from the voice how did that could you talk about how the blood sweat and tears thing happened mm that that's a that's a great uh that's a great story about you know if you ever end up on a show like that everything is 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 your career after that's going to be based off your relationships you make on the show Mm -hmm. um so i right after i left the voice i i played a lot of solo shows and because we've got uh, we have a two-year-old that you may be able to hear right now (laughs) (laughs) he is not wanting to go to bed yes he's having a good time um I I, deci- I decided that solo touring would be far too stressful for my young family, who is that's my top, that's my r- really only priority. Basically, um, that would be too stressful for them, and so I went back to Park Ranger and after the Voice for a little while, and then had the opportunity. Just got a, a call one day from uh, from my friend Michael Lee, who was also top twenty four on the Voice. We 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 hit it off instantly whenever we met uh getting ready for blinds because we both like blues and the classic soul and he called me and he said hey man i uh uh i'm gonna put you in touch with a guy that uh that i think you need to talk to he's he was looking at both of us for um singing for a band for blood sweat and tears but i'm already michael at the time was already singing for bb king's blues band Mm -hmm. um and so he was like and so i i told him that that you were you you should you're the one for the job anyway and so michael lee is one of the main ones that uh if, if we were they were steadily comparing the two of us for for that job and michael was the one that told them like i oh, know keith this he's made for this uh this voice made mm-hmm. for this band uh can you describe i already know can you describe your first show with blood sweat and tears terrifying <laughs> absolutely terrifying um, that that um, singing for blood, sweat, and tears is a is a uni- It's an honor, really. I mean, that's a that's a band that's fifty four years old this year. They headlined Woodstock. You got legends like David Clayton Thomas, Jerry Fisher, um, Jocko played with Blood, Sweat, and Tears. Mm-hmm. Just an unbelievable fraternity of musicians uh, that have been playing for them throughout the years. Um, and when you show up to your first show with them, there are no rehearsals. I mean, you know this, I'm just mm-hmm. telling you this oh, no. with my yeah. eyes all big. Yeah. Uh, there are no rehearsals whatsoever. You have to show up and it's an incredibly hard book. The, the musicianship that goes in, I'm not like saying that to like brag about singing and like it is a hard book to learn and it's a hard book to maintain. And so uh, you show up, I showed up at uh, Fort Lauderdale. Yeah. Fort Lauderdale for the Great American Beach Party on May 24th of last year and uh, no rehearsals met all the members of the band that morning saying I love you more than you'll ever know at soundcheck and then blasted it in front of about 8,000 people Mm -hmm. and it was absolutely terrifying but it's so much fun. Uh, Could you talk a little bit about how you prepare for a show with no rehearsals because there are a lot of people you know even sorry even uh you know even in some like orchestral gigs and like musical gigs there's at least one or two rehearsals before it gets gone how do you prepare for a show 
with no rehearsals. Um, with with blood, sweat, and tears, what what the majority of us do. I mean, the most the band members all have charts, and uh, with but with the vocals though, you're you're finding a sweet spot. <clears throat> excuse me. You're finding a sweet spot between what has already been done. Cause I'm 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 a in that band that a band that has had people like David Clayton Thomas and Jerry Fisher and Bo Bice, you're, you're trying to take what they did and respectfully redo it mm -hmm. while also making it a little bit of your own. That's, that's one of the best things about that band is they've kind of given me free reign because they know on some of the, the hits, like the, the Grammy winning hits, mm -hmm. you, you want to sing them the way they've been sung. Cause that's the awesome version. Right. Uh, but then on some things you can just kind of go nuts and do your own thing. That's so, cool the with in preparing for that what we uh what i just did was sat there listening to the record and looking at lyric sheets and then they send you five just folders of uh board record recordings of live shows mm -hmm. and so you you listen to like a, a song like more and more you listen to every version of more and more that's been done for the past 20 years gotcha. and just kind of fig because the songs also shape and change mm -hmm. over time. And so you just uh, make the best version of it that you can. You know? That's cool. So, so you just, there's a lot of improv you know, like you yeah. improvise quite a bit during the shows. Yeah. And it, from what it, it like, we, we harp on listening a lot, but in, in a situation like yours, you just had to like make like listening was one of your main pri uh, practice priorities. Mm. Cool. Um, cool. Uh, Catherine asked, what has been your favorite blood, sweat and tears moment so far? Um, my, um, one of the, the real defining moments for me was, uh, when I first started with them, I, I, w I played the Fort Lauderdale show. Then we did a, a, a residency at Disney World and, and Epcot Center. And I just, I felt like I was struggling uh, with learning the book and, 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 you know, you're, you're suddenly also, you have to not only sing a really hard book, but you also have to be a showman and mm -hmm. find your own way to, to work the show. And I just felt like I was struggling. And then the next show after Disney was, um, in San Diego. I can't remember what the show was. It was, a, it was a fairly large crowd. And the owner of the band, who's the original drummer, is named Bobby Columbi. Mm -hmm. um, it was a huge name in the music industry. One of the, you know, the original people that signed Mariah Carey, a huge, huge name. Um, wa watched me during sound check, and I was feeling pretty low. And uh, he kind of gave me a little bit of a pep talk mm -hmm. before the show. And uh, I, I played in and I sat, I, I played the show and just gave it everything I possibly could. And after, after the show, he sat me down and he was like, you're doing the best, like you are making the songs your own um, and also being respectful about the way it's been done before. And so that, that kind of just set it off for me like, okay, yeah, I, I, can, I can do this. And so it was just a great confirmation from somebody that I have a lot of respect for. Cool. Awesome. Um, this is one from Julie. Uh, let's see. Just, Keith just addressed this in part, but hearing in his last point, uh, how much freedom of expression he feels for interpretation from his lead singer predecessors. Say that again, I'm sorry. So like how much room for interpretation do you feel you have? Is it an evolving process? Yeah. Uh, no, I, I uh, kind of have a, I've done the, I've done 80 something shows with them now, I think. Mm -hmm. And, and we're, we're adding new things in and, uh, and we're constantly changing up little things um, just to, just to be more tasteful. And so we have as a whole band, we have a, a lot of wiggle room as far as what we want to do, because we change, uh, we might change who gets a solo right here or may change the way we do this and that. Mm -hmm. And um I feel like a lot of the songs that hits like spinning wheel, you want to sing them as close as you can to yeah. the David Clayton Thomas version. But some things like, uh, um, some of the songs I try to just make my absolute own yeah. I, because I take, I take some of the songs like, uh, I love you more than you ever know. I think that I like the original version, but to me, Donny Hathaway and, um, uh, Amy Winehouse did 
incredible versions of that song. So I try to borrow a little bit from all of those versions. I got you. Um, so this is, I mean, this is a very big topic for a lot of musicians right now. Uh, like what are the financial and just kind of buzzkill ramifications from getting a gig you feel well suited for and waited for, and then having a bunch of stuff canceled? Um, it is devastating at first. Um, and I, I remember I was, you know, we're talking about defining moments in, uh, in that career. And I think one of them was one of the best that probably the best the, my favorite show that i've ever played hands down um happened in in new hampshire in plymouth new hampshire it was the very last show that we we did with blood sweat and tears it was supposed to be the first night of uh like a seven day run that we were going to do and there it's right at the, this is right at the beginning of the pandemic and so things weren't quite shut down yet but everybody was uh getting ready for it to shut down mm -hmm. and a quarter of the original audience showed up for that show, but they knew like, because I part, partly because they could just figure it out. But I also told them at the beginning of the show that we're going home after this. And a lot of my buddies right here really introduced them to everyone in the band. Like this is my friend that plays trumpet right here. He's the sole breadwinner in his household and his, he's got a two year old daughter and his wife has a, they've got another baby on the way. And so, really introduced everybody mm -hmm. um and those people just gave us every it, it gave us everything it was it was unbelievable that's awesome. how hyped that audience was and that was uh i think probably the most real live music experience i've ever had uh, just because everyone was so um open and appreciative of one another because the, the you know with live music it's not just the band it's the band and the audience interaction yeah. so. so there's definitely a, a real huge. connection there that evening oh yeah absolutely very cool. very cool um so uh this is from gary reeves uh this is a three-part question We're, we might break it up because they're they're multi-segmented but uh do you do you have any plans after blood sweat and tears have you thought about what or how you're gonna do things how after yeah. yeah how we're gonna w survive <laughs> words yes no i mean like uh do you have any plans for like after the blood sweat and tears thing if any um i blood sweat and tears has been great because it's not i also know uh the lead singer tower of power marcus scott mm -hmm. uh he's a he's a he's a memphis guy too and they tour their butts off i mean all year and uh he and i hit it off pretty well because we're both about the same age with the like wife and children and all that and and, mm -hmm. and he is on the road all of the time and, and one of the good things about blood sweat and tears is that uh, you're you're playing 80 some odd shows a year but you also have time to write on your own you have time to meet other musicians that uh and and keep in touch with them both from that band and from your own local scene um and work on you have time to work on your own projects mm -hmm. and so um i um uh, i just want to i just want to write a lot of um as much music as i possibly can and uh, kind of lift up my local scene as much as i can thank you got a rep midtown yep. very cool uh a couple of these are the same uh, uh gary asks how many songs have you written and so does Catherine. do you get much to play much solo work uh anymore and any songs in the works i think that's a really good transition into kind of what you're doing now yeah if you want to I'll talk about the the we create now thing yeah um one of the um as far as how many songs have you written i i write i write a song almost every day um and that's uh part of that now is with a a, a project that i have with the, with some other creative people it's not just uh uh it's not only open to songwriters it's to we have some visual artists and some other people that, that participate too but uh this is all based off of a, a project that did last year um mm. which was inspired by a lady named grace askew she's a fantastic memphis singer songwriter she did a daily songwriting challenge where um every day she posted a photo on instagram asking people for comments she drew them out of a hat and wrote a song and then went immediately went live with it on instagram and facebook every single day for over two years um whether it was whether the song was polished whether she you know sometimes she messes up on guitar sometimes she's off key and so that's the whole purpose is not to uh is not to just rack up a bunch of songs the purpose is to get out of your head uh, about your own craft and stop uh um 
stop shooting yourself in the foot as far as um, being overcritical of your work, um, which is, I think, something that's major for musicians. And so right now I'm doing a, a similar project. I started it with some people off of a, a live streaming service that I've, I've partnered with called YouNow. Uh, it's just younow.com. There are a bunch of great musicians there. Um, but the project's called we, the We Create Now Project, where I post a photo every day on the We Create Now Project Instagram. Uh, people leave a comment. I draw one out of a hat. And then all of us collectively, some of people collaborate, but we all go and write a song, write a poem, draw something uh, based off of that prompt. And then we meet every single day at 11 a.m. Eastern time and and discuss and show off our work. And so the, the point is that right now, right now, especially we're so bombarded with so much information all the time that everybody needs to just take a moment to uh, express themselves and be creative instead of constantly taking in information. Yeah. Practice being creative. Super cool. Yeah, absolutely. I, th I think from, from my whole journey, one of the, the best things I've learned is that um, you're not going to, of course you can, you can find things to help you when you're, you know, if you're struggling with something like depression or you're burnout at your job or something like that, S try to stop consuming information for a moment and just do something creative for a little while. And that is, it's huge. Very cool. Uh, quick question from Amy. Do you ever sing way down we go that you sung on the voice? Uh, I'd, I'd ha I have to do that one on you now all the time. I got you. So I mean, that's, that's like your that hit, man. That's yeah, your hit, I mean, man. Got it. Um, from, Let's see. Uh, what do you, yeah. What do you feel is your biggest inspiration in your songwriting? Um, I have so many dad songs. Uh, on a, not on a on a joking level, I think you you have to find your why anyway. And my number one why is always um, my number one source of inspiration is always my family because that uh, they're especially my son. It, it, just woke me up and uh made me realize that there's so much more than just to life than just working all the time very cool mm -hmm. um i, I kind of want to do like a like not necessarily a quick backtrack or anything but i mean since your time on the voice uh and the blood sweat and tears and you're doing the we create now thing um you've done a lot of other things yeah. you've you've tested out a lot of other things um this is a two-part question like what are one to three things that you tried that worked for other people that didn't necessarily work for you mm -hmm. and what are one to three things that you really enjoyed so we can start with the things that you didn't that other people are doing that didn't work for you necessarily mm. <coughs> um one uh one person that really uh conti and she continues to inspire me um it's just something that i couldn't continue to, to really do and she's somebody that i really got started uh by emulating is a lady named kina granis uh she's a singer songwriter youtube star um kina granis start got started doing acoustic covers on youtube and she still posts loads of acoustic covers uh, on youtube and has a great just a fantastic incredibly honest open and connected with her audience business model and that's how she she makes her living um but i uh i like to post covers but my whole i i i think it's so much more valuable for me personally to write new songs uh like create things based on my own experiences because it's it helps me mentally and and it also it, it just feels like i uh I, I like writing songs better. Gotcha, <laughs> gotcha. Cool. Uh, now, as far as like plat, uh, creative, creative platforms or methods of uh, reaching your audience, what are some things that you've experimented, 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 experimented with? Um, I, uh, you know, because we have, do a lot of live shows, and uh, the 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 difference between playing a solo live show in a in a very small room and a and a blood, sweat, and tears show in front of thousands of people is a huge difference in your persona and how you connect with people. Um, but uh, in addition to some of those live shows, I've also done loads of live streaming on you now. That that's a it's whole that's a whole different process because you're you're also you're playing the show and you don't have anybody to look at, but you're also interacting with the chat during the during the show. So in a way, it's a little more intimate than a live show because 
you know, you're not going to go watch someone's show and have them talk to you in between songs, really, you know? Yeah, I got you. Cool. Uh, this is from Dr. Coffee. Um, hey, Dr. Coffee. Hey, man. Uh, I have to say, as someone who knew you a little back in the day, that I'm not a bit surprised about your success. B BSNT seems like a real departure for you. Would you prefer a sing singer songwriter gig? Can you and your talented brother do something together? Aww. Uh, we can. I mean, hey. we can talk about it. Yeah. <laughs> hey. Um, B uh, BSNT for me has a. Uh, I I have a love for song. You know, songwriters like John Prine. Uh, that you know it's not it's not blasting loads and loads of notes but it's still um, thoroughly encapsulating the human condition and delivering it to you you know uh, but I'm also a huge you know I'm not a, a music teacher but I'm a music nerd and I and blood sweat and tears the mu the musicianship involved in that band and the amount of the chops that you have to maintain to 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 play with a band like that or to hang with a band like that is uh it's just fun and it makes you a way better musician and in my mind um i have a uh uh like a reverence to songwriting and its telling of the human condition but the better you get at at the the musical like the melodic side of that the better you can deliver that too um so it's a uh, to me it's it's a uh, it all goes together cool uh do you think that being a park ranger helps with your creativity in your songwriting absolutely yes um i and i and I, this is something i wanted to to hit on tonight and and really uh stress is that i, I meet a lot of songwriters and it's and you, you see you know you meet people at an open mic or or whatever all the time we're like how long have you been singing people are like well i've been singing since i was two it's all i've ever wanted to do and that's there are people like that that are that's great. That's, that's absolutely fine. But if you're not one of you're, if you're not a person like that, that is, um, is getting in your head about trying to, to play music for a living or to try to write your own songs. Um, you don't have to be intimidated by that because your experiences weigh heavily. Um, whenever you're drawing inspiration to write your own songs, it doesn't have to be, um, you don't, you don't have to only be a musician to write good songs. Cool. Um, oh, we were talking about Dr. Coffee asked about if you and I are doing anything together. You want to talk about that real quick? Sure. I mean, okay. King and I've always been playing music together, uh, but we also have an album coming out very soon. Um, like a couple of weeks. <laughs> yeah, we have. Uh, when I got back from the Voice, um, can, I stole Keegan's band because Keegan has a, <laughs> <laughs> because Keegan puts together great shows uh, full of great musicians, and uh, um, and so we named that band the wolf river gospel and now keegan and i've continued to write some songs together and we're launching it as its own project called the wolf river gospel um we recorded an album last fall yeah last october at uh young avenue sound yeah, young avenue sounds so that should be coming out within we're, we'll be trickling out the first single to that within the next couple of weeks right? yeah if all goes as planned. Yep, and it's uh, it's great if you like really funky, fun Southern rock. That's uh, that's good stuff. Cool. Uh, Ashley asked, "What group would you like to headline at this moment or with this moment?" What? Oh, dream headliner gig right dream now. Dream headliner gig. I mean, right now we've uh, I'll, we we've been out for a while. I would like I would I really miss playing with my my buddies with blood, sweat, and tears. Uh, I wouldn't mind uh, having some huge uh, headlining shows just as a Wolf River Gospel, but I'm also totally fine playing um, um, small shows too. Mm -hmm. Oh, Julius Hill, King, can you all give me a small live taste of that since you are in the same room? Uh, well, I need a real equipment set up. We can't. I mean, I've got the song. I might just be able to sing it, send it the song so we could play it real quick. I don't know. Uh, maybe we can try uh catherine hitting me in the field with all these john prine comments what's your favorite john prine tune uh, i've got several um uh oh man i spanish pipe dream was huge spanish pipe dream may be the reason that i decided not to go to grad school and get married and go move out into the woods and become a park ranger <laughs> <laughs> from spanish pipe dream uh it's uh 
people that are not familiar is blow up your TV, blow up your TV, throw away your paper, move to the country, build you a home, plant a little garden, eat a lot of peaches and try to find Jesus on your own. It's a, that's a very powerful song. That's brilliant. Um, so this was, this was one question about uh, a while back, but if somebody um, wanted to do what you, if somebody wants a career like yours, uh, what, I, I go back to the one to three thing just because it's pretty concise. Uh, what are one to three things that you would you tell somebody that wants to make music as their career in this current climate? In this current climate. Okay. Yeah. Cause things are, I mean, I mean, aside from, from the, the coronavirus thing too, just like in the 21st century, in the year 2020, um, things are much different than they were even five years ago. So what right. are some, what are some pieces of advice you would give, uh, to someone right now that wants to make music as a living? The, I'd say that the absolute, the absolute bottom line truth to that, uh, no matter what, what year it is, but it's something that I feel like we especially need to remind ourselves of um, the way social media works and the way that g the musician grind typically, typically goes is to forget that you're grinding and be absolutely honest and genuine and make real connections with people whether it's in an instagram group chat or it's out on the street or at an open mic night to be absolutely honest and vulnerable and open and make real connections with people that's that's fantastic uh joey sam park ranger and performer seem like polar opposite jobs socially speaking did mm -hmm. you change anything about your life to accommodate the change from having very little social interaction to having heavy social exposure as i mean uh the oddly enough as a park ranger you also you you deal with uh I think a lot of people think i just spend a lot of time by myself in a truck in which you do but you spend an an a lot of time interacting with people um, sometimes in situations where they want you to be there and sometimes <laughs> in situations where they really don't want you to be there. And, uh, uh, I also did a, quite a bit of public speaking while I was there. Didn't do a lot of like musical shows, but, uh, did a lot of public speaking and you just spent a lot of time interacting with people and learning how to be, uh, uh, be friendly to people, be friendly and open to people. Cool. Uh, I, I have one question, uh, because you talk a lot about um, practicing creativity and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm wearing a running nerd shirt right now. No and like, you know, whether it's like exercising or being creative or something like that, it's really easy to hit walls at certain times. Do you have a specific uh, mantra or thought process when you hit a wall in your creativity? Um, what One of the best bits of advice I ever got, I was doing a co-write with Grace Askew. Uh, who's like my hero as as a songwriter um i was doing a co-write with her one time where we had an hour we'd drawn 10 words out of a hat and we had to use all 10 of those words um and then write a song in an hour based off of it and so i was in, naturally i was panicking and mm -hmm. uh uh we kind of got stuck after yeah I, I usually just throw out a first verse and a chorus real quickly and then when you get to that second verse is when things start to get hard mm -hmm. you have to continue and pivot that story and uh she i was like what do you do when you get stuck do you ever just start over she said no i write faster wow and so um that kind of makes me think of uh uh reminds me of somebody that i talk about with uh with the we create now project all the time he i actually never heard of him until he passed away his name is daniel johnston uh, he's one of the first real uh uh known diy musicians he would be he would be writing and recording songs on an answering machine and sometimes things are off key and off beat but he still put them out there and those songs became the treasured soundtracks to a lot of people's lives um, and so just because you don't think something's great doesn't mean that somebody else is not going to I'm not saying that you should uh, really sacrifice what you think is quality. Um, but uh, every, all of us have similar feelings and similar stories. And so uh, no matter what you say, somebody's going to be able to relate to it. Fantastic. Um, so I've got one. I, I usually, oh, Lizzie, sorry if you hit this already since I'm joining a little late. What are some helpful songwriting tools for musicians who want to get started but are intimidated by it? How do you determine if something you've created is worth keeping around? 
I I have a um I I mean I have the the I guess the luxury here is I go live with the new song that I wrote almost every day, and uh, some things I can if if I truly don't like it if if I wrote it and I truly don't like it that's going to come out in the performance that's going to show, and so I'm I I keep everything on an Excel sheet or on a on a on a Google sheet everything's cataloged. And sometimes I write, no, oh, this is a keeper. This is not a keeper uh, because I did the exercise. I was creative that day, but it, the song, once it's finished, just, it's just not really something I enjoy. Um, so bounce it off of your friends and see what they think. And then uh, um, if it truly doesn't resonate with you or with them, then log it off is still very important, still a productive use of your time, but maybe it's not a keeper you want to play at shows. Pl practically speaking also, I'd say, uh, there are websites like Rhyme Zone that are amazing. Uh, Rhyme Zone. Huh? Yep, RhymeZone.com. You can if you're you know you're trying to finish that line, you can it gives you it's just a rhyme dictionary. Oh, did yeah. not know that. Cool. Um, cool. Uh, so I usually oop, Julie's typing something. Oh, why Julie's typing? Um, I usually close out with my my podcast interviews with this question. I think it's really good. Do you have a favorite failure? Um, I have a lot of, a lot of things that I, that I think I thought were failures, um, at the time and, uh, turned out to be, turned out to be blessings. Cool. Uh, I think when I, when I, right when I came off the voice, you, every, every, every person that ever, uh, does, does something like that you're in a strange position afterwards where you're trying to figure out what to do. And, uh, you've just gone through this whirlwind of, uh, of things. And for me, I wanted to hide. Uh, when I get, when I get upset, uh, I just, I'm, I want to go away and, and have everybody forget me. And, uh, um, uh, one of the best things I, I did was say, I, this is, not what I want to do. This is trying to maintain this and trying to do this while raising my family is a mistake. I think I can do it, but I, but trying to do it with my family, uh, is a mistake. And so I went back to being a park ranger mm -hmm. and that was the best thing for me because then I could pursue my craft and pursue my own creativity and my own art on my own time. Yep. Cool. Fantastic. So not, not, not being, not uh, deciding not to be a full-time musician made me a better musician, I think. Cool. Uh, conversely, like, have you ever had a favorite like moment of inspiration? You know, um, Julie's asked who helped you stay strong other than the support you have from your family. I always love that. Uh, can you speak on a moment of defeat, which we overcame to inspire others? Hmm. Stay strong other than the support. I mean, I, I have a, a great network of friends uh as far as people that help me stay strong uh you know when Ke i guess keegan doesn't count he's my family he's my best friend but he's also my family but um uh the some of the musicians i've met with blood sweat and tears are absolutely unbelievable have played with uh have had incredible careers and for them to treat me like a brother uh and to you know call and check up on me and stuff and give me pointers and also uh, just tell me how excited they are that, that I'm with them is, uh, is huge for me. That's it's in for somebody that didn't come from a background in music, uh, in, in any kind of like formal training in music, that's hugely validating. Um, so that's, that's major, but I think you also have to, you got to figure out a reason that you like it on your own too. Cool. Awesome. Um, so you've got the, we create now thing. Yep. What else is going on? We're around, yeah, it's 753. So, what else is going on? What else is go well, right now, um, spending a lot of time on We Create Now because I'm <laughs> trying to develop that program. Uh, mm -hmm. work on our website right now. Uh, we've partnered with uh, uh, with you now on it. They're 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 gonna to help us out with it. Also, partnered with a uh, a, a streaming platform called Movie Karma, which is uh, for independent artists and and filmmakers it initially started with filmmakers but uh to inspire people for uh social change for the the things that they believe in and so i'm really excited about working with them um and other than that and instead of uh 
I'm trying to record everything on my own because I think that's a, that's a whole new level of artistry uh, that's fascinating to me. So cool. Awesome. Well, I think, man, yeah, dude. Awesome. Well, thank you guys for having me. I feel like I, I just uh, answered questions the whole time, but I, I, mean, I hope that if anybody, you know, if any of you have any kind of questions or anything like that for me, I'm extremely open. Uh, so hit me up on Twitter or Instagram or Facebook or anything. I'm, uh, uh, I'm Keith Peluso everywhere. So I guess we will uh, end with this. Tune in weeknights, Mondays, Tuesdays, and Thursdays at 7 p.m. Central Time to watch Keeping the Beat live and remember to tell your friends about our program. Presenters who wish to apply to host an episode send applications via tnmea.org. Thanks, Thanks for, for watching, watching. everybody. I was trying to catch it <laughs> Thanks for watching. Uh, you want to try again? Yeah, let's One, do it. Two, three. Thanks, Thanks for, for watching. watching.